Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Buster Show. Today, we have a very special guest. We've been coordinating this for a minute, and I am very grateful that we made it happen because Justin Kamine is in on the show. My friend, how are you? What's up, buddy? How you doing? Doing great. We have a lot of ground to cover, given all the extraordinary things you're working on uh, with Upgrade, KDC, you know, Earth, and everything, everything of that nature. Uh, you know, not not to go too crazy in on you know a bio, but I know you're Forbes 30 under 30, and you were ranked uh, in the 50 most impactful. What what was it? Entrepreneurs in the U.S. That yeah. is just mind boggling. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was just a typo. I don't know how I got in there. <laughs> No, that's definitely not the case. Um, I want to ask how, before we, we dive into your companies and different endeavors, uh, how did you first get started in the entrepreneurship world? Is this something that you always thought you were going to be diving into when you were younger, or is this something that came about from an opportunity off of a different job? Yeah, it's, it's definitely been something that's run in the family. Uh, and I owe a lot of the entrepreneur vibes to uh, my parents and, and specifically my father, uh, who really, and, and both he and my mom came from nothing. Uh, but uh, throughout those kind of past 20, 30, 40 years, uh, he, he really became one of the best entrepreneurs that I've ever met, building a lot of the big businesses from the ground up. But most importantly is the humble beginnings, right? He started off as pretty much a plumber and installing wastewater heat recovery systems and boiler rooms and walking through the back door of, of companies, uh, not just the front door and recognize that at an early age, it's a human connectivity, right? Every business is built on relationships and human uh, connectivity and human capital. And uh, he leveraged and, and built a pretty substantial kind of couple major uh, infrastructure platforms nationwide and energy and telecom. And then uh, my brother and I got the entrepreneur itch uh, pretty much right out of college. Uh, I went and tried to work in the big corporate world, very quickly recognized that I uh, <laughs> needed to really build my own things and, and, and develop my own companies. Um, and we came up with a thesis about 10, 12 years ago as a family that the world's screwed, the world's fucked if we don't change in a massive way and how do we do so. There's only one way to really do so, which is I think build the right businesses with the right core focuses, the right emphasis on the humans, the environment. How do we all come together? Um, and we said, great, let's put our money where our mouth is. Let's figure out how to start to really build the future that we all want. Oh, that's amazing. Before we dive into where this conversation is naturally leading to upgrade, um, do you remember your, your very first business? Because every entrepreneur has some ridiculous story. Like for me, it was, you know, literally taking my baseball and basketball cards to like uh, these sh sports card shows that I would force my dad to drive me to. And then I would walk up to like these tables of old men and be like, you guys want anything? And then they would like buy one. Uh, do you have any, any, any early businesses from when you were younger? Uh, so I was, I was like, you know, stealing my mom's vegetables out of her garden and selling them at the cul-de-sac, which then they forced, all of our, they forced all of the neighbors to come and buy. Uh, my brother and I did that for a couple of summers. Uh, I think that the, the main first one, which was really cool because it actually enabled my thought process and my core value as a person, which is kind of like, just throw it out there, right? Always, always do something and you never kind of know what, it, what it's going to lead to, uh, was actually in high school and it started a nonprofit. Um, we watched literally, and I grew up in New Jersey, uh, kind of in the horse country world of New Jersey, um, and it's called the Garden State for a reason. But there's a, a, a 2020 special that I that we saw as uh, in a journalism journalism class in my high school, and, and uh, it was all about Camden, New Jersey, and a lot of the crime and a lot of the, the uh, um, unfortunate kind of dynamics that were occurring there. And I was like, this is crazy. This is 35 minutes away from me. It's we're all kids, we're all humans, and yet they're living in a completely different life than I am. So I literally just penned a, a, a letter to the principal at the high school that was being uh, kind of profiled at that time and long story short all of a sudden my my phone rings and this was literally landline into the to the house at that time 
my mom's like, 2020 is on the phone for you. I'm like, huh? And all of a sudden, the letter that I wrote to him, just exposing how I felt as to how crazy the, the discrepancy of where we were living and yet so close to each other. Um, and all of a sudden, 2020 kind of built this whole little thing about us going down there and, and working together and, and building a true friendship with both of the high schools and working together and, and uh, having both uh, their arts program come up to our stage and then our kind of sports teams go down there. And uh, the program's still running, I think, to this date. And it was all called Students for Change, which was just a literally a simple act, a simple letter. Uh, and now we've created this entire ecosystem where I think it, it's been pretty beneficial um, and really connecting people. Oh man, that's, that's super cool. Um, so I want to talk, I want to talk about upgrade. Um, I know, you know, Jake, Jake and I, who, who connected us, shout out to Jake. He's the best. Um, <laughs> he was telling me a, a little bit about it, but I'd love to hear from you kind of the, uh, essence of why you decided to start upgrade and what, you know, where, what the goal is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and shout out to Jake. Thanks, buddy. Um, yeah, so so Upgrade got started. So I've been a um, kind of a disruptor kind of over the past 10 years, always looking at environmental and, and human health and kind of the whole food is medicine movement. Um, and Upgrade got started about a year and a half ago when I read the stat that stated that 86% of our healthcare costs are spent on chronic conditions and only 3% are spent on preventing them. $3 trillion per year the U.S. spends on chronic conditions. It is insane. Talk about pain and inflammation, arthritis, diabetes, cholesterol, heart health, all things that we know that with lifestyle changes, we can really be proactive and preventative with. Um, and I just thought that that was absolutely insane. On top of that, yeah. I was tired and, and am tired of watching all of my friends, families, and loved ones take these synthetic chemicals on a daily basis. That 45 seconds out of the minute long commercial is a warning label of how it's going to kill you 10 other ways. And it's like, why do we accept that current status thinking and that status quo? So I did kind of what any, I guess what my kind of nonprofit in high school taught, taught me, right. which was I, I cold called the former chief innovation officer of New Avon, who was the global R&D director of clinical supplies at Pfizer, who had headed up open innovation at GlaxoSmithKline, and she was a VP of R&D at Nature's Bounty. And I asked her one single question, which was, how come no one has ever taken a top pharmaceutical-like scientific approach to clinically study fully plant-based products, run real digital clinical trials or double-blind placebo trials to create the right patient-reported outcomes, and actually link the top pharmaceutical scientific approach with fully plant-based ingredients, and really create the next iteration of proactive and preventative healthcare. Um, I think at that time she she told me it's impossible, you can't do that. And uh, two weeks later, she quit her job full-time and joined the team and. We've been fortunate and blessed uh, to now be joined by about 20 kind of worldwide people. We got bipartisan support uh, at the kind of top level. Uh, we, we brought in a bunch of other pharmaceutical executives all joining the mission of really leading and, and focused on how do we really systematically change healthcare and really make good nutrition, high quality products that are actually and truly backed by science. If you want to talk science, let's talk science and really showcase that with good nutrition, good plant-based and a good lifestyle, we can really be proactive and preventative with our healthcare system. Because quite frankly, we absolutely need to. And most importantly, uh, which is really the human mission that, that we're focused on, it's A, not only how do we create this better proactive healthcare system, but also how do we make it affordable to every single person? And, and I think that whether you talk about racial inequality, uh, economic inequality, there's a huge healthcare inequality and that stems a lot from access and affordability to the right high quality products or ingredients. So every one of that we, we develop uh, is always at a dollar a day. And let's all really come together to, to create the healthcare system that we know and we need. Oh, I love that. Now, how much of it in addition to this do you think is just educating people on how poorly the, you know, or... I guess a better way to phrase it would be how, you know, 
very frequently the commercials that are thrown in our face uh, are for things that aren't good for us. And then those invoke poor dietary decisions and poor life decisions in the sense of your long-term health that leads to some of the things that you were mentioning, the government and the country and lots of countries are putting so much you know, back into. And it's not about the money. We don't want anybody to suffer. We, don't, we want everybody to be good and healthy. That's all really matters. Um, so how, how much of it do you think is uh, educating people in terms of making their, you know, decisions outside of this better? And then does this have a positive impact for those who then take, do those things right? Uh, do you think they, yeah. they should still take, like somebody, you know, like myself, we were talking about how yeah. I cut out sugar and carbs from my diet. I was eating yeah. I was eating pretty bad before. I was having Chipotle three times a week. I never cooked. I never cooked, made anything. With but now having switched to the current, um, you know, dietary choices that I'm I'm making, is this something that somebody like me still needs? So two part question: <laughs> Is it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I I think. Listen, we're we're all in the instance of there is no silver bullet, right? There's no, there's no special pill. There's no special substance that someone's going to take and say, great, I can keep going off and eating Burger King and fast food and processed foods and still be healthy across all the board, right? Our big focus is how do we get better every day, right? Every, every day we can get a little better, right? There is no silver bullet to your point about cutting sugar. It's like, okay, great. You went through a transition and now you're starting to feel better but it wasn't that, oh, I cut out sugar one day, and then all of a sudden I feel the way right, I feel right. now seven months later, right? So it's all about, how, okay, how do we continue to build the right practices on top of each other, but also recognize that, okay, we all got to have fun, and we all, that, that burger does taste delicious, and there's, there's a balancing act, right? What we got, I think, in, as a society is way overly balanced, where you can go and buy four burgers for $4, and you can get a salad for $6. It's like, well, wait a second. So where do we find that, that good balance? And from a pharmaceutical perspective, I'm fully supportive of pharmaceuticals. They've done an ama some amazing work for acute problems and helped solve a lot of the world's problems. But for daily chronic conditions, we all know that they're preventable with good nutrition, with good lifestyle, working out, and then good supplements that actually adhere to the right science and the right evidentiary data to actually create the flywheel in the ecosystem to actually sit there and say, hey, guys, we can actually get healthier and better. Um, so I think what's been amazing actually over the kind of past year or so um, has actually been the huge rise in telemedicine. So telemedicine is booming. If you look at any of the investor, in, what, investors what and all telemedicine? the telemedicine. Yeah, so, so it, great question. So a lot of companies are implementing it for their employees and a lot of other companies are just implementing it and providing it to everyone. But it's really the recognition of, hey, I want a lifestyle coach. I want a nutrition coach. I want to put my information up on a kind of the dashboard and actually build and be a part of a co collective community to better my health every single day. And so that understanding from a consumer's perspective, and of, and of course, during COVID, I think that got expedited that much greater where people were yearning and wanting a community, wanting to get healthier and recognizing, okay, if I'm going to be here for six months, how do I really better myself, right? And so that was all kind of part of the coaching. Well, they talk a lot about lifestyle changes, right? How do we get your 10,000 steps? Everyone's got a different type of wearable. How do we kind of work on, okay, it, it, figuring out how many calories you can burn a day? Um, and then they really also focused on how do we eat better, right? Okay, let's eat a piece of broccoli every two days because it's going to help X, Y, and Z or whatever it may be. And so what we at Upgrade are doing is providing that missing link which is here's the top pharmaceutical like scientific approach of a product that is in fully plant-based form that, it, that helps people increase compliance with that collective flywheel because they can take it every single morning with their coffee and all of a sudden they start to feel better. They, 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 for our first product, it's really focused on to kind of daily inflammation. Um, our second product will be much more focused on to actually controlling glucose. Um, but the first product is really okay. You can start to really feel better every single day, which then fuels 
I want to go work out more. I, my, my knees don't hurt as bad, right? I don't need to take all these synthetic kind of ibuprofen-like products mm -hmm. uh, to just try to get back into the gym. And so all of a sudden, to our point in the beginning, you're able to get better every single day and continue to build and recognize that being healthy isn't this I can't do it type of kind of immediate roadblock. It's great. You can still have your burgers and eat, eat your fries. We're not saying no to that. It's like, okay, but how do we do so in moderation? And how do we do so in a better co collective way? That's really what this whole program's about. Right. And also, you know, set yourself up, you know, for a long-term future. And the younger you are, the better you are. Is, is that what you found as well? Yeah, uh, it's, it's been fascinating. So our products go up and down from grandparents down to, down to uh, kind of middle school kids. And because uh, we're really focused on just improving the body on a daily basis. Um, and it's fully organic and or plant based, even down to the excipients, which are essentially the glue that hold the tablet together, uh, are even fully organic, which has never really before been done. So a lot of really cool innovation from that perspective to really adhere to what the consumers really want. Um, but it, it, it's, it's been really cool as we've kind of kind of progressed and, and developed all of that. that um, we've identified the target consumer, or at least, which is kind of the people at, at, at our age, 35 year olds, that for the first time in their life, they're looking at themselves in the mirror saying, oh shit, am I getting old? And, and all of a sudden, right? So it's because uh, when you're 20 years old, you can't, you can just kind of wake up every day and keep doing it. But at, at kind of that 30 to 45, your doctor's saying, hey, you don't need to go on anything. We don't need to prescribe you anything, but you need to now start to recognize that you are at high risk for X, Y, and Z. How do we now really be proactive and preventative? It's that first recognition as a real human for most people um, that, hey, I got to start to really take my health into my own hands. I got to really get working out more and, and, and eating better and uh, putting better things into my body. Mm, interesting. Now, I, I can speak uh, on behalf of idiots because I am one. I, I take this, I know nothing about anything, right? But I take this, uh, uh, I, I forget even what it is, but I take like a daily vitamin or whatever. Um, and I also take like some gummies or whatever for my skin. I don't know if they work or not. Honestly, I probably should have looked into it before I, before I, but they taste good. And I take like one or two a day. Or whatever. I was on the phone with somebody the other day and they were telling me, you know, if you, uh, if you already have, if you already eat healthy and do these things, um, you're at risk of overdosing on some of the good stuff. Is that, can I overdose on the good stuff or is that not really a thing? I'm not a doctor, man. I don't know. Uh, I've never heard of that, but. Yeah, me um, too. I think, I think he's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I, I guess, I guess if you're eating those gummy bears or gummies that, that they, if you're just eating them just for taste instead of uh, kind of what they're oh, focused well, I'm, I'm, I'm them right. for their focus. That's the other part <laughs> of the benefit. Um, so if, if somebody wants to, uh, wants to start taking their, their long-term health very seriously, um, what, what is their move to, to get started? you know, whether it be through upgrade and, you know, do they, do they just go, um, buy the, the pills or, or do they go consult with a doctor? How does that process work? Yeah. So, so great question. So we are NSF certified, which means we actually from professional athletes on down to Navy SEALs, we are fully certified from the quality control, the regulatory, uh, dynamics, um, and very open and transparent with the science and, and the product formulation. Um, so I would recommend that the moment that um, you would go on kind of obviously to our website and, and start buying the product um, and just take two every morning and just to start to see and recognize um, how much inflammation is really in your bodies. Um, it, it's been fascinating as we've started to really understand the, the use cases and we have a lot of clinical uh, evidence and clinical trials on our ingredients and the final formulation of the product when it is used on a consistent basis two, three weeks kind of build up into your body that the results have been absolutely incredible. We've had people call us up saying, I didn't even think that I had inflammation, but, um, and, and I was an executive chef and all of a sudden um, kind of after two weeks of taking our product, they're saying, I didn't feel bad, 
but I didn't recognize that I held all my inflammation in my fingers. And now my wedding ring is actually sliding off pretty quickly. Um, and and wow. so we have a lot That's of stories like that, uh, e even up to uh, amazing partners like Julian Gressel, who, uh, who's on DC United and the Kembe Matumbo, all taking our product Kembe. on a daily basis. Yeah, Dikembe is awesome. Uh, t taking our product. So, so it ranges all up and down the gamut to my grandparents to you, you name it now, really engaging with this whole proactive and preventative. But at the end of the day, aches and pains and soreness and cortisol levels and inflammation, we all have it. That's why I created it. I mean, we created it with my, my co-founder. I was dealing with chronic neck and, and back pain and I'm 30 years old, 31 years old and working out every single day and, and staying, trying, trying to be relatively fit and healthy. And yet here I was feeling like I was hung over every single morning because I just couldn't, couldn't release the tension. Um, and so we really, at the end of the day, created it for my own kind of problems and, uh, but yet recognize how big of a issue inflammation and also enhancing recovery on a daily basis is for so many athletes, professional and, and non, but also just the daily person just going on the soul cycle bikes and coming home and saying, great, that was fun. And I want to now do that in a couple of days again. Um, it's been amazing from that perspective. Um, and really building up into the bodies um, and, and really providing those long-term benefits. The actual clinical evidence showcases the more you take it on a long-term basis, the better and better you are uh, from a body's perspective because inflammation is one of the root causes of pretty much uh, a majority of kind of major health problems in the long term. So what is it uh, in particular? You know, I'm, I'm scrolling the site here um, yeah. that reduces the inflammation and what, what are the main things yeah. that help that, that, that do this for it? Yeah. So great question. So we combine a multitude of product or ingredients together to create our final products. Um, we partner with a company called Jividon, which is one of the largest uh, ingredient companies in the world. Um, and everyone knows turmeric is a, a good anti-inflammatory uh, ingredient. Um, but what's really the anti-inflammatory components of turmeric is really what's called the curcuminoids. So Jividon figured out a way and, and through their patent uh, extraction methodology to standardize the turmeric down to the curcuminoid level. So thereby you're getting the same amount of curcuminoids in every single dosage. And then made it the world's first 100% bioavailable and water-soluble product. So the water solubleness enables it to be absorbed into the bloodstream that much quicker. So you're not only getting a standardized dosage every single time, because quality control and, and certainty is key and critical for us, not so much for the rest of the kind of supplement aisles, but you're getting a standardized approach and you're getting and able to absorb it into your blood that much quicker. On top of that, and there's a whole myth behind black pepper that's not needed. Uh, because what black pepper tries to do is it really it tries to make the turmeric that's not water soluble more water soluble by kind of uh, inflaming the, the, the gut to absorb the turmeric more. Now all of a sudden you don't need that because you have 100% water soluble ingredients. You don't need black pepper. On top of that, we paired that with a clinically studied ashwagandha. Um, so ashwagandha has been used in Ayurvedic medicine for a long time, centuries. Um, and that is clinically studied to actually reduce cortisol levels. Um, in combination with that, we paired it with a, a black cherry, uh, yeah, black cherry um, and a ginger extract, and which all, all, also so show good kind of promotion of kind of daily inflammation help. Um, and so when you create all of that together, what really happens is the ashwagandha is a, a quick release. So you do feel relatively something within the first day or two or three days. Um, and that's a reduction of cortisol that ashwagandha is really enabling. And then over time, the next seven or 10 days, as the turmeric and the ginger and the cherry start to build up into your bloodstream in a good positive way, that's when you really start to see the inflammation. Uh, and so it's that combination, which is to, to the credit of my co-founder, she helped formulate a lot of these other kind of major products that are on the marketplace I, the one now focus of what she's doing as a former C-level person at a lot of these big pharma companies saying, great, take your same scientific approach of how you formulated all these products in the past and solely focus it onto the highest quality ingredients 
that are fully organic uh, and really create complementary and synergistic benefits. So that's pretty, it's pretty crazy. I'm not going to lie. It's pretty crazy. Um, now, you, you know, we, we opened this off talking about the environmental uh, benefits to all of this. What do we think the, the biggest, uh, biggest benefits are that, that come from it? From the products? Yeah, from, from just uh, changing the system, having it done in a plant-based fashion and, and kind of yeah. everything under the umbrella. It, it, it all goes back to that first line that I said, which was reading the stat that stated that 86% of our healthcare costs are spent on chronic conditions and only 3% are spent on preventing them. We need to balance that out, right? That, that equation is completely tipped in the wrong in a reactive synthetic-based chemical system, right? It's, oh my God, now I have a problem. Now let me go get something. We got to be proactive and preventative up front for everyone. Everyone can be it, right? That's, that's, that's why the products are so universal. Unless you have an allergy with a certain ingredient, they're, they're good for everyone. And so we need to rebalance that equation. That's the sole focus of what we are doing. And a lot of the health providers will tell you, that's why I mentioned telemedicine and that boom, because a lot of the, everyone's recognizing that guys, we got to become healthier. We're, we're one of the, 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 the highest obesity rates and the highest, you, you name it from a chronic condition rates, right? Uh, health, heart health and everything. It's like, what are we trying to do? We're trying to improve the health of all Americans and every single person all around. That's why our entire product portfolio will be focused on those kind of largest chronic conditions because with that and lifestyle changes and better access to good, healthy foods, we can really do something special here. And hopefully in two, three, four or five years, we're back here saying, hey, now the equation's 50-50, which is a much better um, outlook for, for humanity. It's really interesting. Yeah, I think it's I, I, I it's super commendable. I I'm a fan. I think it's I think it's super exciting, and I'm I'm happy for you, and uh, you know, just happy that that you're trying to help people because I love people who are trying to help people. Um, speaking of of helping people, your other company, uh, KDC. How did how the hell do you balance your time between the the two of these? <laughs> A hundred percent and a hundred percent. Come on. <laughs> That's the correct answer right there. Um, yep. So on, on your LinkedIn, it says uh, KDC Earth is uh, doing sustainability at scale, having built over $3.5 billion of national infrastructure and, you know, putting that money into develop systems to solve some of the world's biggest environmental problems. Uh, what What is the... I guess in your own words, kind of what, what is the difference here between some of the other work you're doing? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it's all at the end of the day kind of goes back to that core thesis of we're all screwed as a society unless we have massive change. Um, and, and how do we really start to enact that and put our money where our mouth is and really build shit. Um, and so what, when K KDC is a, a, the, uh, as I kind of mentioned beginning my father um, and his whole kind of background of, really being an entrepreneur. Um, so we're fortunate and blessed that, that he's still building companies with us. And his whole background was building uh, about 600 megawatts worth of natural gas co-generation facilities, becoming one of the largest uh, independent power producers. Uh, that was his first business uh, that GE financed about $800 million into. Um, and then he very quickly transitioned that into building infrastructure for telecom nationwide. Um, and had one of the largest privately held telecom companies kind of spanning 40 cities. And uh, so my brother and I very fortunate and, and inherited kind of this entire platform with him. Um, and we sat down and said, okay, how do we focus on to sustainable technologies that we can help get to scale, get to that infrastructure level to really make the systematic change across society that we all know that we need to get to. Um, so at that time, about 10, 12 years ago, we started KDC Solar, uh, built about 125 megawatts of solar projects for companies that uh, many of major pharmaceuticals. We made Six Flags, one of the first amusement parks in the world to be 100% powered by solar. No and, uh, way. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And uh, 
Then about five years ago, solar was great. It got down the cost curve and all of a sudden everyone's accepting it, loving it, embracing it, recognizing, okay, this is actually affordable and, and, and accessible to everyone. Um, and we said, great, kind of our time there is done. Let's now focus and, and go find scientists, technologists, agronomists, chemists, scientists, working on world-changing ideas at the lab scale or at their university or in the pilot kind of facilities, yet that had no idea how to get them from the lab scale to that large scale infrastructure level to scale nationwide or worldwide to, to, to truly realize the impact of what they were working on. And so us being kind of, we have a good mixture of a bunch of uh, engineers and finance kind of people and people that really build businesses. There's, there is that core focus of my dad walking through the back door as of installing boiler rooms to now, okay, how do we now build infrastructure? It's a very u unique combination. Um, and a lot of the core team over those past 30 years is still sitting around the table saying, great, now let's go build stuff. So what are we doing? We're really focused. So we launched KDC Earth um, and we're scaling a, a nationwide uh, uh, food waste platform where we take about 200 tons of the food leftovers from supermarkets after we can donate uh, as much as we can to local food banks because that's the maximum usage of food. But we take about 200 tons every single day at each one of our facilities. We hope to be building 50 of these to solve food waste. But what we do is we actually upcycle that food uh, into an animal feed the very next day to create a completely closed loop waste free agricultural oh, system. Cool. Um, but at a, at a massive level where we can work with some of the largest retailers and some of the largest growers and really create a better, more sustainable, healthier, entire food system for as many people as possible. Um, so that, where, would that, where would that food be going otherwise? Just into like a, the ocean or the waste or wherever the heck they put into, it? Into, into landfill. So the U.S. throws away, listen to this, throws away 40% of all the food that we grow. It is, if, if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter, the US China food waste. It's close to 60 million, 60 million tons. You said that's just the US? Yeah. Oh my God. Are other, do yeah. other countries figured this out better than us or is it? There, uh, there are some countries that are, but um, the, gra the, the, the scale of what the U.S. operates on is just so, so immense. And we're all so used to, if you think about what our food system is, right, whether you're going to Whole Foods, where you're going to Walmart, no matter any time throughout the year, no matter the season, you can get whatever you want at all times, right? Pretty there is no season. There's no seasonality. There is no understanding of where that food is really coming from unless you're really shopping at the farmer's market. And so that entire disconnect is now just the reality of where we are in. And you have literally, if you can imagine, you're, you buy five grocery bags and two of them, you just throw away right when you buy them. That's the reality of what the U.S. currently does. And most of that goes to landfills where then it creates more methane gases, which are obviously a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So this entire system, let alone think about all the farmers, energy, the fertilizers, water that went into creating that food that's now just getting thrown into the landfill where it creates more greenhouse gases. This is an entire system that we can, we as society and, and with our technology and infrastructure can actually solve over the next three to five years. By 2025, we can actually become relatively waste-free from supermarkets so long as we upcycle this into an animal feed, they're used to eating exactly. When we used to grow up on farms in the 18th and 19th century, we used to take our leftovers and feed it to our chickens, pigs, and pets out back. And they right. grew healthy, they grew better, and, and it, was a, it was a closed loop system. And we, we as humans recognize that that was the best, max, best maximum usage of that food was to feed our animals. It was easy. Well, now we're just doing so on a Actually, large scale. You can eat them anyways. <laughs> exactly. And, and, that, and now we're doing so at a large scale infrastructure level with a couple hundred million dollars kind of behind us to scale. Yeah. Oh, my God. Did I lose yeah. your video? There. Your video. No, I'm right here. Sorry. Um, so you're taking uh, like a, a, an exact example of this would be a supermarket, you know, throws away 40% of their food or whatever. 
and you guys then have trucks that go pick that up and then bring it to a farm or you guys bring it to a facility that turns it into I think you and yeah you're not frozen and then you bring it to a facility that yeah. turns it into yeah. food so you're, you're, and you're, where where am i yeah. wrong there i'm trying to understand no, no, the you're, process you're, you're pretty you're pretty close, man. So, so we work with the supermarkets. Uh, we, we put uh, two different bins out there, one for the produce and one for the meats. Um, so we pick that up every two or three days. We bring it back to a centralized processing facility. So this is where that infrastructure comes in. We have an 85,000 square foot facility that can upcycle 200 tons every single day. 200 tons is a lot of in, uh, uh, input. Yeah. Um, and we then grind it up, we, we, we convert it down to a uh, dried animal feed. Uh, so it comes out and it looks exactly like what you currently think of an animal feed. Um, and then we can ship that immediately to uh, some of the growers and really create this closed loop system so that then they, they can grow the next chicken with a feed ingredient that's created by us, upcycled grocery product, and put back into the entire ecosystem and all of a sudden you now have a closed loop waste free system that's actually the best for the animal, best for the environment. And we are waste free as a society. Wow. Now is this is this your number one focus when it comes to um, when it comes to KDC or are there other similar things like this that you're just as focused on? Yeah, so this is uh, kind of the primary focus, but then there's a very uh, substantial kind of platform being built underneath it as well, um, actually doing a, a very similar approach uh, to cardboard and uh, waste paper. So if you think about all the Amazon boxes, right, all the, all the delivery, right, delivery is just skyrocketing. Um, and uh, all of that, uh, not all of that, but a good portion of that uh, is just over flooding our municipalities and their waste uh, haulers. Um, so we're building a nationwide network. Uh, if you kind of understand the kind of consistent theme here, building a nationwide infrastructure network uh, to actually upcycle uh, millions of that of tons of, of that product um, kind of throughout the nation, clean it, repulp it and dry it to create once again, a closed loop cardboard system so that we hopefully no longer need to cut down more trees uh, to continue to create the fiber uh, put into the cardboard. Wow. Now, in terms of this, these, these incredible world-changing things being businesses, are, are, is there any goal to make any money from it, or is it totally 100% charitable? What... The, the only way to have the greatest impact in the world is to have the greatest profitability and thereby you can actually have the greatest impact in the world. These are businesses first and foremost that, oh, by the way, are amazingly sustainable. So, so talk we, to me, how, how does the business part of it work in? How, so let, let's, let's use the first example that I, I want to ask you about yeah. um, in terms of the trash, taking the trash uh, or taking the, the uh, you know, throwing away food and turning it into um, you yeah. know, going through all these facilities and yeah. turning it into food for the animals. Where, where do you make money? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, we don't, we actually don't call it trash and we don't call it food waste. We call it food leftovers Got because it. we actually, we actually are able to maintain the cold chain. So that food is still fresh and still kind of human quality. Um, but, but of course, like I said, we donate as much as we can. And then the next best maximum usage of foods come to us. So it's a different terminology kind of usage. Um, right, right, right. but, but, but we'll, we'll I, go I, appre I appreciate the correction. <laughs> you are a thousand percent um, right. Yeah. So, so then, so then I process the, or we process the, that food down to an animal feed and then we're selling that animal feed into the market um, and, and in, in through a couple of different ways. So just like a major grower would buy a corn and soy like product to be fed to our animals and said, they're buying our product. And like, like we, I said that it, they're, uh, economically viable solutions and economically, um, I mean, that's at the only, that's at, at the end of the day, the only way that I can sit here and say, yeah, we can solve food waste in the next five years and to build out that nationwide infrastructure. When we go back to what we kind of talked about, how do we find these scientists, technologists, and agronomists working on these world changing ideas? Well, a good portion of that engineering exercise 
yes, is the actual engineering of the facility of, or the scale up of the technology, but it's also the business engineering as to how do I drive to the right financial metrics that then someone's willing to give us hundreds of millions of dollars or a billion dollars to go and span nationwide and say, go, go off and build, right? So there's a lot of that all coming together to then sit here and say what we can say about how do we really scale these things and these solutions. At the end of the day, there's an amazing amount of great sustainability ideas and concepts and, and, and ingredients and all that type of stuff. I think that the, the consumers want to be a part of this solution. They want to purchase better with their, I want to buy this product because it's actually helping to save the world um, or better the world. And I can do so with my vote, what I buy on the retail shelf. So consumers are lining up for that and desiring that. Um, but at the end of the day, it has to be in a price range that makes sense for the retailers and for the customers. And that's really at the end of the day, how you really solve some of these world problems. Oh man. And then theoretically, could you take this then to every country? Yep, absolutely. Damn. That is very exciting. Yeah. Have, have any world leaders or any, anybody of that stature reached out and, you know, wanting to support however they can? Yeah, I, uh, we've, had, we've had a couple. Um, uh, Prince Albert, Prince of Monaco, I won an award uh, from him. Uh, actually, I'm the most environmentally progressive technology. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have people like Ann Vanneman, the former U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, on our board, as well as people like Howard uh, W. Buffett, um, grandson of Warren, um, guys like Sam Cass, who's Obama's former executive chef and many others. Um, so we're fortunate at the end of the day, it goes back to kind of what we originally talked about. It's about human capital, right? It's about the people that sit around the room, people that believe in the mission. Every business is, goes through lefts and rights and ups and downs and oh shit, are we going to make it? Oh my God, we're going to solve the world, right? And, and it's, it's everything in between. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the people uh, sitting around the table and, and the mission that the company has. And then making sure everybody knows what's good. Um, <laughs> that's, that's why I'm appreciative of you, man. Likewise, much more so. Um, and I, I know you're also a board member of Earth Day, which is uh, the largest, largest civic platform, you know, focused on, on, on Earth. Talk, talk to me a little bit about Earth Day. I've, I've never heard of it before. Yeah, so Earth Day started, uh, don't quote me on this, about 40 years ago or so. Uh, but it's literally about convening kind of prior to Instagram and everything, the capability to really convene a global movement. Um, they really started, in, I think, in right around 1970s or so um, as the first kind of major initiative as to understanding that we're all so connected, right? You talk about global trade, you talk about global food system, global everything, right? So, so what happens in South Africa, Africa, New Zealand, in America, it all intertwines so much. And I think that's what Earth Day is so, so special about. Of They really were a, a pioneer of convening that thought process and the recognition of the way that we in the U.S. treat our environment does have an impact on the way that island nations or South America or wherever affects not only with the global um, emissions, but also the global trade um, and how all that comes together. So to your point about us buying better, right? If, if we're buying more sustainably grown produce, well, might, may, that produce might be coming from South, Africa or South America and on up. So therefore, we're actually incentivizing the farmers down there to really actually want to improve their soil and, and reduce the, the carbon intensity and all of this type of stuff. So I think Earth Day is one of the largest uh, civic movement uh, kind of platforms uh, kind of connecting that. But as I look kind of in the future as to where that can really go, it's just furthering, further emphasizing that at the end of the day, we're all defined by our species, which right, it's human. Yep, and uh, our species, I mean, it's crazy when you look at the, uh environmental statistics on the general just down roller coaster it's like six flags except it's not what you're doing it's quite <laughs> the uh it's the hands up while you're going straight yeah. down um but but, but, but but to that point so i i love the comment where and i've spoke speaking spoken at a lot of kind of conferences and stuff 
and and sometimes you get some uh republicans that, that kind of stand up and say okay i don't believe in climate change i'm like great let's not talk about climate change to your point let's talk about resource depletion right populations going up resources are going down and there's a tremendous inefficiency in, in the middle so if you care about national security you actually want a closed loop system right which mm -hmm. is really how do i get, get one plus one equals three right you want resource uh, efficiency or, or redu reduction of our imports okay well all that leads to creating a more sustainable doesn't have to just be this green kind of dynamic sustainable means business profitable resource effective and efficient and yes, what does that all entail? Well, we get all of our resources or majority of our resources from the earth. Okay, how do we create this right ecosystem that makes sense for everyone while simultaneously driving what I believe is gonna be actually the entire next economic frontier of exactly to that sustainable infrastructure that's at scale that can really reinvent these systems that are currently inefficient. Uh, it's so it's so smart of you too because I feel like oftentimes, you know, those sorts of people who will deny something like climate change being real, I feel like it's usually an ego thing more more than anything else. So take that out of the question and then just start worrying about the the details of it all. I, I want to yeah. ask, um, you know, you're you're like pioneering this concept but when you look at other people who are trying to change the world and they're like in elon musk for example right he's changing the the car game and you know trying to make reusable rockets and, and things of that nature is there anybody else you know out there that you you would want to partner up with to change the world or anybody you you look towards and are a fan of of what they're doing in terms of trying to make you know the world a, a better place similar to yourself yeah i i think there's um I look at a Richard Branson as well. I mean, Elon's one of kind of my heroes as well, um, from, from at least his capability to build multitude of platforms at once and get them to scale and have huge positive impact or at least a disruption of the current status quo. Um, I look at Richard Branson as, as another. Um, and then I, I've, I've been quite fascinated by uh, two others that are uh, pioneers in their own thought processes, which is uh, Wim Hof and his whole kind of breathing methodology and, and understanding of his own uh, self uh, creation of, of had, had the, his own respect for his own body in such a unique way um, and the appreciation for what we don't always know. Um, and I think all the kind of arbitrary kind of rules that we've put on ourselves in society. And then same thing with David Goggins, um who is just from a mental health and mental focus and that kind of manifestation of you wake up every morning and you even though some days suck you smile at yourself in the mirror and then you just start to say you know what i am i am this i am that and and let's really be positive and winning that mental battle i look at winning the mental battle winning the physical battle and then those with branson and elon as kind of the two uh pioneers that that's kind of kind of my, my basis those are a lot of good dudes right there. They have, uh, <laughs> they've done, they've done a lot of, a lot of, I've definitely had moments, you know, uh, with the exception of Wim Hof so far, I've yet to, I've seen, you know, I, I saw the, the guys at Yes Theory did an incredible documentary with, with Wim Hof um, that I watched, but I haven't, I haven't tested, I haven't dove in any ice yet. I haven't done the breathing. Um, I meditate for an hour every day. And that is something that, um, <laughs> I really like and That's recommend. That's impressive, man. Um, That's awesome. But it, there's no, there's nothing specific about it. I just sit there and think for an hour. Um, but uh, Richard, the man, uh, Elon, obviously, and then David Goggins. Oh my God! <laughs> how how do you think? What do you think are the biggest things you've you've picked up from that dude? That. Um... Every and and I love it when uh, I think he's with a uh, 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 Jeffrey uh, Itzel, I think his name. Um, where it's uh, just every day is gonna suck, and just wake up and just okay, and and you do something that that sucks every day, and it's just like okay, by the time you just build up that mental tolerance of of whatever things are gonna suck. Okay, great. How do we all get through it? And I think from an entrepreneur's perspective, what I think makes us unique is that when you are building a multitude of different platforms, 
you can have the best day and the worst day at the same, and it's the same freaking day, right? And, and, and that's such an emotional mind fuck that it, it's very difficult to truly manage that. So what we, I, and what my kind of main focus is, is, okay, how do you just keep emotions flat? And, then, and it gives you a clarity, it gives you a peace of mind, it tries to reduce some anxiety from, from a lot of the kind of dynamics. But at the end of the day, I think as a human, you've never really felt anxiety in a way until other people rely upon you for a paycheck. And sometimes you don't know where that's coming from and, and what's all coming on, right? And, and yet you know that people's livelihoods and families are sub subsequently relying upon you to figure it out. And I think that stress, but yet that also respect and, and understanding um and then kind of that goggins mindset of just you just push through you'll figure it out and yeah you just got to kind of make it work however you can um and that persistence of just that grind that's kind of the the main philosophy that's those are some great things to pick up yeah he he, he always says embrace the suck and it's so true you know you just gotta you got to do it. And, you know, I definitely, one of the reasons why I started running long distance was because of him. You know, I saw him do it. He said, I, I run seven miles a day. I was like, all right, I'm going to try that. So I started doing it. I'm, I don't do seven now. I'll do like four. Sometimes I'll do seven, but split into like four and four or four and three or whatever. But yeah, um, yeah, he's an, he's an animal. I mean, yeah, but, sure. but, but, but it's cool. Oh, I mean, you think you, yeah. But, but I mean, like, look at yourself, right? It's like, okay, it's, it goes back to what we were talking about. It's like, you don't have to go from zero to a hundred. It's like every day you can get better. And like, you're just yeah. building upon that. The real, the real game is being better than yourself from the day before and not, I feel like, you know, from my own experience, not comparing yourself to anybody else because nobody will ever be as good at being you as you. And that's uh, as, as a, a, a very good thing to know. You know, I, I love that. And I, that's one of my favorite kind of mental kind of uh, philosophies. And then right. the other one, have you, heard, have you heard about the dash? What's that? So, so um, there was actually a gentleman that was, I was at, speaking at an event and uh, he got up in the back of the room, grabbed the mic and started walking up the aisle and pointing at me saying, Justin, what is your dash? You have your, your dash and everyone is defined by their dash. He turned around to the entire rest of the room and said, everyone in this room is defined by their dash. What is your dash? And I'm like, sir, with all due respect, I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. And he literally walked up on stage and put his arms around me. And he said, listen, the day that you're dead, you have the name that you're given, the day that you were born, dash, the day that you're dead. Your dash is your legacy. Your dash is your contribution for society. It's not about freaking how much money you made. It's not about how many Instagram followers you have. It's about what did you contribute to society and what's the lasting impact on that contribution. That's a great one. That's really great. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, the only things you know, they always say in, in the memes are, uh, that are guaranteed are death and taxes. So you might as well, <laughs> you might as well do, do the best for the world that you can in the meantime. Um, um, unless you're unless you're Donald Trump or is that too soon? <laughs> <laughs> it's never too soon. It is never too soon. Uh, it's so weird too. You know, today I was just, well, I, I guess I shouldn't say just because how fast the world changes. Sometimes I'll say something in a podcast that won't be true by the time that I release <laughs> it. So I was going to reference what he did to cryptocurrency today, but I can't because it'll probably be in a different position by the time anybody's listening to this. So um, I, I want to ask what, if you had to go back and tell, you know, I, I'm 20. If you had to go back and tell your 20 year old self one thing, uh, what, what would you tell yourself? Um, I, I think probably everything will be okay. And, and just, just keep following the heart, keep, keep following the passion. Um, I was a big yes man kind of to start. I, I think I drove my parents and, and my brother and sister crazy. Cause I would just say yes to everything, every meeting, every coffee, every 
why are you talking to this person? I don't know. I can spare 15, 20, 20 minutes for everyone, right? And you never know where it went. Um, there's a lot of times and a lot of sleepless nights that I didn't know where I was going or what was happening kind of in, in, in life and business. And why did I meet that person? Well, that didn't really work out. I thought I had such high hopes for this and maybe this connectivity will, will actually really turn into something. And the people that I didn't even expect are all stunned some of my closest friends and the ultimate business people with me. Um, so I think just taking a deep breath and saying everything will be all right and follow what's core to you. Um, I think it was, is the best dynamic. And I, and I do love what Gay, Gary Vaynerchuk often says, which is just self continuously self audit yourself. I don't need to be the best in everything. I need to be the best in my two or three things. Um, and then find other complementary people that are the best in what they do. Um, and together you can kind of create a really good team. That's it right there. And uh, now how do you balance, um, you know, I'm, I, I know you're by nature of everything you're doing, you don't have the capacity to be a yes man anymore, but how do you balance, you know, doing random new things with different people while also protecting your mental energy? Because oftentimes, and this is a situation that I find myself in, right? I'd love to talk to everybody. There's nothing that I want to do more than talk to everybody. I have all the time in the world to talk to everybody, but I have to say no to most people just because I can't take the risk on these five minutes ruining my day. Yeah. Yeah, I think, listen, it's, uh, it's something that I'm still balancing, right? There, there's, there's no right recipe for any of it um, because inherently I, I respect those so much that helped me get to where I am and, and play that kind of connectivity role. And I'm such a pay it forward person um, that I try to do that as much as possible. But there was a time I don't know, a couple of years ago that I was just paying it forward all day, every day, making connectivity to everyone. And I sat down at six o'clock in the afternoon being like, I didn't complete anything that I set out to do today, right. but hopefully everyone else is doing theirs. So there, there was a very interesting balance as to, I kind of found my kind of core 30, 40 people that I know I can call upon kind of no matter what kind of my, my tribe. And uh, that, that's kind of been where I've kind of centered a lot of my time, energy and resources from the pay it forward kind of vibe. Um, and then always, always happy to uh, find some time for the right people. That's great. Well, Justin, I think myself and everybody else who listened to this knows exactly what your dash is. Um, <laughs> and I, I appreciate you coming on. It's all very exciting here to support every step along the way. So thank you for coming on. Thank you for, for this, man. Really appreciate it. Awesome. All right, everybody. We'll see you on the next one. Peace.